Good afternoon. My name is Tatiana and our topic today is the use of deep brain stimulation for the treatment of refractory epilepsy. And when we talk about surgical procedures, it is well known that the decision is more important than decision. And this is particularly true for GBS as proper patient selection, proper target selection, and a careful planning are crucial for achieving good outcomes. Having this in mind, our agenda will start with some background, followed by the three main targets in DBS for epilepsy that are the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, the central median nucleus of the thalamus, and the hippocampus. We will then move to how we plan the procedure and what are the adverse events related, and we will close with our final remarks. Starting with the background, DBS consists in the use of electrical current to modulate pathological brain secrets. And this can be achieved by two ways. It can be done with an open loop stimulation in which electricity is delivered continuously or intermittently without the need of a trigger or in a closed loop way in which electricity is delivered on demand. And who are the candidates for these procedures? They can be divided in two groups. Patients with refractory epilepsy who are not amenable to resection, or because they have multifocal seizures, or because their seizures involve eloquent brain areas, or the ones who fail previous resections. And what are the targets used? We will start with the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. This nucleus is located anteriorly to the Y-shaped internal medullary lamina of the thalamus. And it receives fibers from the mammillary bodies through the mammillothalamic tract, and it projects to the cingulum. So it's part of the papa circuit. That's why the candidates for these procedures are patients with focal epilepsies. The ANT may be seen in cadaveric slices, as appreciated on the right. It's generally easier to find the mammillary bodies, then follow the mammillothalamic tract all the way to the ANT that is located in the bottom of the frontal horn of the lateral ventricles. And the ANT may be subdivided in three nucleus: the anteromedial, anteroventral, and anterodorsal. The anteromedial, whose projections may be seen on green, is the one who projects to the prefrontal area and is related to the feed forward information regarding cognitive and executive functions. The anteroventral, whose projections may be seen on red, projects mainly to the retrosplenial cortex and the subiculum and is related to the return loop to the hippocampus. And the anterodorsal, whose projections may be seen on blue, projects mainly to the retrosplenial cortex and is related to nerve navigation. And how do we find the ANT? If we compare images from a 3T MRI with images of the Chateaubriand atlas, we may appreciate that the ANT is not located exactly in the same spot when we regard indirect coordinates. So, regarding the mid commissural point, the ANT is generally located 0 to 2 millimeters anteriorly, 12 millimeters superiorly, and 5 to 6 millimeters laterally. But when we look at the position of the active contact in different patients, as we may appreciate on the right, we identify a significant variability among patients. That's why we prefer to use the direct visualization method to target the ANT. And this can be achieved using the steer sequence, the one that increases the contrast between the gray and white matters, because it's easier to identify the mammillothalamic tract that's seen on the axial, on the coronal, and on the sagittal view. And the area we have to place our electrode is exactly the point where the mammillothalamic tract enters 
the A and T. And to demonstrate the importance of the correct placement of the electrode, when we compare responders to non-responders, meaning patients with more than 50% improvement, it is possible to notice that the responders have their electrode placed exactly where the mammillothalamic tract enter the A and T. And what are the pathways that can be used to place the electrodes inside the nucleus? Our goal is to place the majority of the contact of the contacts inside the A and T. And this can be achieved by a transventricular pathway or a paraventricular pathway. But we always have to be careful with some vascular structures as the thalamus striatal vein that is located laterally, the superior choroidal vein that is located medially, and the internal cerebral vein that is medially and inferiorly. When we go transventricular, it's easier to place the majority of the contacts inside the nucleus because of its inclination. Although when we enter the ventricle wall, the electrode may deviate a little. On contrast, when we use the paraventricular trajectory that is very lateral, it's more difficult to place most contacts inside the nucleus because of its inclination. So we prefer to use the transventricular to put the electrode exactly on the sweet spot. This is a patient that had a frontal epilepsy with more than 60% uh, improvement of his seizures, but we may appreciate that the right electrode deviated a little after ent entering the ventricle, although this didn't influence his results. And when we look at the literature, we have two randomized trials. The first one was Sante with 110 patients, and it showed a 40% reduction in the active group after a three-month blinded phase. In its follow-up study, there was a 69% reduction after a five-year follow-up. The other randomized trial with 18 patients showed a 77% reduction after the six-month blinded phase, although after uh, a year, only 40, 18 patients were responders. This is the graphic of the follow-up of the Sante study, showing that after five years, the 74 patients that were still being followed showed almost a 70% improvement and what is interesting and should be highlighted on this graphic is that the improvement in seizure frequency was progressive over time. And this is something that is generally seen with neuromodulation. The main adverse events, the ones that were statistically significant between the active and control groups, were depression, memory impairment, and confusion of state. Moving to our next target, the central median nucleus of the thalamus. This nucleus is part of the intralaminar group and it projects diffusely to the, cortical, to the brain cortex. And it's related to diffuse cortical recruitment. That's why it should be used in patients with generalized epilepsy. Although there are some groups there studying ways of direct visualizing DCM in the MRI, we still use indirect coordinates to target it. And we generally go 10 millimeters, 9 to 10 millimeters from the lateral from the midline, 1 millimeter superior to the ACPC line, and 1 millimeter anterior to the posterior commissure. The CM is actually a complex with the parafascicular nucleus. It is located more lateral and is related to sensory motor functions, while the parafascicular nucleus is related to the associative and limbic functions. On the right, we may appreciate the areas of cortical involvement after CM stimulation. And we can um, see that the main areas are the ones related to sensory motor functions. 
Here we have the final position of electrodes in three different patients, showing that they were positioned one millimeter in front of the posterior commissure, as seen here, one millimeter above the ACPC, and nine to 10 millimeters lateral to the median. And when we look at the literature, we have one randomized trial that was done with patients with generalized and focal epilepsy. And when we look at the overall results, there was only a 30% improvement in the active group. However, when we look at patients only with generalized seizures, for example, patients with lennox gasto syndrome, they showed more than 80% reduction in seizure, fre in seizure frequency. And this was also observed in other studies. And our last target, the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a structure located in the medial temporal lobe, as seen here on the sagittal and on the coronal views. And it gives rise to the fornix that will end at the mammillary bodies, that will project to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and then the cingulate. So it's also part of the papal circuit. That's why it should be used in patients with temporal epilepsy. Differently from the ANT and the CM that are approached by a frontal burrhole, the hippocampus is approached by a posterior burrhole due to its axis. And when we look at where exactly these electrodes are located inside the hippocampus, we have some different places that the electrode can be found. The majority of them, of course, are located inside the hippocampus, but in different areas of the hippocampus, as in the central area, inferiorly or superiorly. But we also have patients that the electrode is located outside the hippocampus, in the lateral ventricle. And this may happen mainly in patients with very atrophic or glyotic hippocampus because of its anterior curvature. So the last contact may stay out of the hippocampus. However, on this study, there was no relation between the electrode position and the result. However, there, is other group, there, there are other groups that advocate the placement of the electrode in the cubicle. So the electrode have to be placed in the head and the body of the hippocampus. The, the tail is more difficult to be targeted because of its uh, medial and superior direction. The hippocampus is approached by a posterior burrow that is generally two to three centimeters from the midline. And this is a bipolar stimulation. So the cathode is placed on the most anterior context, generally at the area of maximal epileptogenic activity, and the anode on the fourth contact. When looking at the literature, we have three randomized trials, actually two randomized trials and one follow-up. The first was the RNS with 95 patients that showed only a 38% reduction in patients in the active group. Its follow-up study demonstrated a 55% improvement after two years of follow-up. And another randomized trial of 16 patients demonstrated that seven in eight patients of the active group were responders. And its follow-up study, there was a 90% reduction in focal seizures with impaired awareness and more than 60% reduction in focal aware seizures.
and how we do our planning. The next slide will show a video of how we plan for the ANT, the CM, and the hippocampus. This video describes the techniques for targeting the three most widely used structures in neuromodulation to treat refractory epilepsy. Our first target is the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. And the first step in planning when targeting a deep structure is to co register the MRI sequences with the stereotactic CT. To visualize the target, the most used sequences are ST and T2, as demonstrated here. Due to great anatomical variability among subjects, indirect targeting should be avoided. The structure to be identified is the point where the mammillothalamic tract enters the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, as this area is related to better outcomes. If one goes back and forth on the coronal slices, it is possible to distinguish first the mammillary bodies and then the mammillothalamic tract, as confirmed on the axial and sagittal views. It is of extreme importance to address the vessels near the target as they may limit the trajectory when implanting the electrode. The burr hole for entering the cortex is generally placed 1.5 to 3 cm lateral from the midline and 1 cm in front of the coronal suture, but this may be adjusted according to the safest trajectory we should avoid major vascular structures and superficial and deep suture. Two approaches may be used when targeting the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, the paraventricular one and the transventricular one. The first, the paraventricular one, has the advantage of going lateral and not through the ventricle. However, as it has a very lateral entry point, it is more challenging to correctly position the electrode inside the nucleus on the sweet spot. Therefore, we rather choose the transventricular one as it is easier to place the interspace of the two center contacts on the target. After the trajectory and the entry point are defined, it is necessary to go down from the cortex to the parenchyma to identify the major vessels that will be encountered. The first vessel is the callosal marginal artery that may limit the trajectory immediately, and after the ventricle is entered, there is the thalamus striatal vein laterally and the superior choroidal vein medially. Our next target is the central median nucleus, which is a thalamic nucleus of the intralaminar group. As it is not directly visualized on the MRI, it is necessary to identify the anterior and posterior commissures in order to define the target. After fusing the T1 sequence with the stereotactic CT, the anterior commissure is visualized on the anterior wall of the third ventricle and the posterior commissure right above the aqueducts. It is also necessary to choose a midline point to correct the alignment of the images. The central median nucleus is located 10 mm lateral from the posterior commissure, at the level of the anterior commissure and the posterior commissure line. Once again, the burr hole for entering the cortex is placed 1.5 to 3 cm lateral from the midline and one centimeter in front of the coronal suture, but adjustments may be needed 
to avoid superficial and deep suicide and major vascular structures. Therefore, after defining the entry point, it is necessary to ensure no major vessel is crossed along the trajectory. The last target is the hippocampus, and this structure is readily visualized on MRI slices. Therefore, it can be targeted with direct anatomic methods. To identify it, a T1 MRI sequence with contrast is used. The first step when planning is to define an anterior point at the most anterior part of the hippocampus head in the coronal slice. The following step is to determine a posterior point at the middle of the hippocampus body on the sagittal view. After defining these two points, they are connected to generate a posterior entry point. This trajectory generally covers most of the hippocampus formation, except from the tail, as it curves posteriorly and medially. A heart cannula, as the one used for the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and the central median nucleus, ensures not only an adequate electric route, but also penetration within hardness structures as a sclerotic hippocampus. After defining the entry point, it is necessary to ensure no major vascular structure or superficial or deep suicide are crossed along the trajectory. Thank you. And what are the adverse events related to these procedures? When we talk about DBS, the adverse events have to be divided in, T group, in three groups. They may be surgical related, hardware related, or stimulation related. The ones related to the surgical procedure itself are infection, and its incidence is variable in the literature. It goes from 5 to 12%, more or less. It was 12% in the Sante series. The bleeding is 4.5%, and this may be avoided by a careful planning, uh, paying attention to the vascular structures that are nearby our targets, and inadequate lead positioning. Also, avoided by a careful plan. The ones related to hardware malfunction are lead migration and lead fracture. And the ones related to stimulation are mainly, it really depends on the target that is being stimulated, but they are generally paresthesia, seizure worsening, and when talking about ANT, they're generally related to cognition and memory. 
Although there were a lot of com subjective complaints about memory, when these patients were tested objective, objectively, the um, alterations were not significant among groups. So this is something that should be more investigated. And what are our final remarks? DBS is a safe procedure for patients with refractory epilepsy, and it has satisfactory results when the candidates are suitable for the procedure. So as we mentioned previously, a careful proper selection, uh, a careful selection of patients, and a careful target selection are essential for a good outcome, as well as a meticulous planning of the procedure. With this, we close our presentation. I really appreciate your attention and thank you.